All right. So you probably heard um, yesterday it was that Elon Musk uh, had bought 9.2% of Twitter stock. He is now the owner of 9.2%. I, I read somewhere how many billions of dollars that cost him. I don't know, but it cost him a lot of money. He's the largest shareholder of Twitter. Uh, he's a larger shareholder, significantly larger than the founder of Twitter and the former CEO who owns about 2%. He is a larger shareholder of Twitter than many of the institutional uh, members, um, the institutional investors. Uh, it, it, it's, it's quite impressive that he's managed to accumulate um, 9.2. I haven't really pulled up a chart of Twitter stock. I don't know if you bought it cheap or it expensive. Um, I mean, tech stocks have been driven down quite a bit over the last couple of months, over the last three months, so uh, probably far from its peak. Uh, Wonder Freeman says, um, that it cost him $4 billion uh, to do it. Free Trade um, has been a member for two months. I don't know. I, I, I don't think this counts as a, as, a, as a super chat. Being a member is not, not good enough. It doesn't help you get to the 600 goal, as Catherine will note for you. But I will read what Free Trade says. He says, Musk, Musk is being hailed as a free speech champion on Twitter. In reality, he blocks people who destroy his anti-fossil fuel narrative. For example, Alex Epstein. So um, Musk is, uh, his argument for going on Twitter is he wants to make it better. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about having an edit button so you can change your tweets after you post them. Um, also uh, to eliminate some of the, um, some things that Twitter does, where, uh, which uh, takes people off the platform or, or puts them or, or forces them to delete tweets or so on. So uh, he's going in there with his own agenda about how he thinks uh, Twitter should be run. Now, today they announced that not only does he have 9.2% of Twitter stock, but today he was appointed to the board of directors. So um, Elon Musk is now going to be a power, a force within Twitter. Now, I have to say, this is beautiful. This is the beauty of a finance. This is amazing. Put aside whether you agree with Musk or you don't agree with Musk. This could be Judge Soros for all you know, right? But the very fact that an individual can take a large position in a stock, get on a board of directors, influence the direction of a company, and fix perceived problems with it that might be hurting its market value is one of those amazing features of markets. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, one would hope that people do it, do it, and they, the results are positive, They're po the results consistent with what we would like them to be, right? But they might, you know, if, if, you, if you're an advocate for Elon Musk taking a board seat and taking 9.2%, then what happens? Are you going to be offended when George Soros does the same thing and argues for a more leftist agenda for, uh, for Twitter or for some uh, social media company? The beauty of the fact that they are private means the shareholders... Shareholders can get on, can buy into the platform, buy into the company. Shareholders can therefore uh, change its policy. Shareholders can go on and determine the future of the company, and it's not static. I did an interview today with somebody who was arguing with me that you know all these companies, all these social media companies, are monopolies. And what do you do about monopolies? Well, here's what you do about monopolies. Buy their shares and kick out managers and change their behavior to be more, I don't know, friendly, more profitable, more. We'll see. We'll see what Elon Musk actually does. We'll see what actually is motivating him. But one option, rather than compete, rather than spend the money to create a new platform that competes with Twitter, and an alternative to that is to just buy and change it. 
And it might change for the good. It might change for the worse. I don't know. I mean, Musk seems to have the right inclinations. Hopefully it changes for the good. But it's just one more way in which one deals with, let's say, corporate behavior that we think is negative, that we think is bad. So Elon is um, using his billions, I guess the money he lost, uh, the, I guess the money he, uh, he gained from sh selling a big stake of, uh, of Tesla, uh, much of that money went to paying taxes, and some of that money has now gone into uh, buying a big stake in Twitter and buying himself onto the board of directors of Twitter and now having an influence on Twitter. And it's going to be fascinating. It's going to be really, really interesting. Does he manage to change the policies of Twitter? Twitter, does he move Twitter in a different direction? Is it better? Is it worse? Will the stock price respond by going up? Will it go, go down? Will it be political? Won't it be political? It's going to be really interesting. So I'm, uh, I am eagerly anticipating watching how this plays out. But again, this is one of the beauties of private business, private markets, is that you get these kind of changes. Without any government intervention without government doing anything. Indeed, I would argue that government is preventing. Uh, why, anybody know why he stopped at like 9%? Why he didn't take 12%? Or because you can accumulate up to 10% of a stock. Well, you really accumulate out of 5% of a stock. And then you have to disclose your interest. You have to let the world know that you bought the stock. If you accumulate over 10% of a stock, you have to let the world know your intentions. You have to file a complicated SEC form that tells the world why you own 10%. Now, before these regulations came into place, and the regulations around what are called 13Ds and 13Gs, which are the different filing requirements, uh, the 13Ds and 13Gs were put in place in 1968. And they were put in place in 1968 by the SEC. These are regulations that make it impossible for somebody, for example, to accumulate 50% of a stock, walk into the CEO's office and fire them because they're the majority owner now and basically replace the board because they own 51% of the company. Guess who lobbied to have those regulations put in place? Guess who wanted them in place? Guess who didn't want to get fired by people who accumulate 51% of the company's stock? Managers. Managers of big companies. Managers of big corporations in America lobbied to have these regulations put in place in order to restrict the ability of people to take over their companies in a stealth way, in a way without everybody knowing, right? Imagine just buying 51% of the company stock on the market, in the open market, and then you're in control. Today, you can't do that. You have to buy five, disclose, and then 10, disclose, and you have to do a tender offer. You actually have to let shareholders know, look, I want to buy 51% of the company. I'm going to pay you X. That allows competitors come in. Supposedly, this is good for shareholders because it creates a bidding war, but it also reduces the number of people who ever go into it. And it entrenches often bad managers. It often entrenches bad CEOs. So imagine a world in which Elon Musk, you woke up one morning and Elon Musk owned 51% uh, of the company and basically it fired its management and was taking over. can happen today, sadly, but that's capitalism. You see, that's what a free market looks like, and it's things like that that suggest that we have no idea what business would actually be like under capitalism. We have no idea the dynamics of what it would be like, the competition. 
the, 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 the insistence on managers to really try to maximize shareholder worth because otherwise somebody's going to buy up the stock and fire them. Capitalism is so much more dynamic, so much more interesting, so much more focused than anything we see today. We do not have capitalism today. And that creates stagnation, it creates laziness, it creates, it, it incentivizes managers to not innovate, to not stay on the cutting edge, to not completely dedicate everything they can to making sure they maximize shareholder wealth. All right, I'm, uh, as I said, I'm looking forward to Elon Musk, who is not woke, who is not politically correct, to uh, see what kind of influence he can have on Twitter. Uh, I think it's exciting. I think it's a good day for social media. I think it's a good day for expression. Um, it, you know, hopefully he opens up the platform. He allows more discussion, more debate, less sanctioning of people. And then maybe other social media platforms learn from that and, and take note of that. And if he's successful and the stock price goes up and people are happier with Twitter and he kind of eviscerates all the competition that is out there, even though it's marginal, then uh, other social media will mimic him. And, and uh, if he tells the politicians to go to hell, as he has done with the SEC on issues around Tesla and as he has with others, um, yeah, I mean, this could be a game changer. This could be a game changer. If we got the kind of um, sense of life and self-esteem of Elon Musk applied to social media companies, the world would be dramatically different. So let's see what happens. Thank you for listening or watching The Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to yourownbookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Your Own Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content and, of course, subscribe press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.